Hi everyone! In this video recording, we're going to be able to define and differentiate anatomy and physiology. So let's get started. To be precise, anatomy is going to be the study of not only the external but also the internal structures and also the physical relationship between these body parts. But in practical terms, anatomy can be classified as this careful observation of the human body. Anatomy was first studied by dissection, which is defined as this careful cutting apart of the body structures to study their relationship. And then physiology is going to deal with how the body works, therefore the function. Physiology is going to be dependent on anatomy because a body part basically is able to perform a specific function due to that part's specific structure. So how the body structure is shaped will define the function. This slide is going to help us understand how anatomy and physiology are defined as such. We can actually say that anatomical information provides clues about probable function. This is because all specific physiological functions are performed by specific anatomical structures. So for instance, this image shows the structures that belong to the respiratory system. So right over here, we're gonna have the nasal cavity, for example, the nostrils belong to the respiratory system. Down here, we're gonna have the pharynx, so the air comes down the larynx, the trachea, and then it will go down to your lungs. Starting with the nasal cavity, which is this compartment right over here that's going to hold the first air that is inspired or taken into our body. The air enters through these openings that are called the nostrils, right over there, and inside the nasal cavity, this inspired air is going to be filtered warmed and humidified. So therefore, we can say that the function of the nasal cavity is to filter, warm, and humidify this inspired air. How is this done? Well, the shapes of the bones projecting into the nasal cavity, see these projections right over here? They are going to cause the turbulence in the inhaled air, and it's gonna make it swirl against the moist lining. This contact warms and humidifies the air and also any suspended particle that's coming in with this inspired air will stick to the moist surface. In this way the air is going to be conditioned and filtered before it reaches the lung which is important to prevent lung infection as you guys can imagine. The link between structure and function is always present but sometimes it's not well understood. So for example, um, the superficial anatomy of the heart was clearly described in the 15th century, but almost 200 years passed before the pumping action of the heart was actually demonstrated. On the other hand, there's also many important cell functions that were recognized decades before we actually had electron microscope to be able to reveal the anatomical basis for those functions. There are several study methods that help us understand anatomy and physiology and how it normally functions, but there are also some study methods that help us diagnose certain diseases. And here is a list of some of these methods. We will be talking more about gross anatomy and anatomical imaging on the next few slides. So let's define embryology and the rest of the terms on this list. Embryology, basically, it's going to be when we discuss in humans the first eight weeks of development after fertilization of the egg. So it's not throughout pregnancy, it's just the first eight weeks. Now, with regards to developmental biology, that's a complete developmental history of an individual from fertilization all the way to death. So basically, all of the history of a human being. Cell biology has to do with, like the name says, 
the study of cellular function and structure. Histology, histo, means tissue. So this would be a study of tissues. And for you to be able to study tissues, you need to use a microscope. So when we define histology, it's basically microscopic structure of tissues. With regards to sectional anatomy, like the name says, sectional is going to divide the body into sections. And it's going to study the internal structures and relationships of these sections. Systemic anatomy, like the name says, systemic has to do with systems. So it's going to study the structure of specific systems of the body, such as, for example, the nervous system, the respiratory system, and all the organ systems that we have in our body. Regional anatomy again, like the name says, has to do with specific regions of the body. So you can study, for example, in the chest region, we have the lungs that belong to the respiratory system. We have the heart that belongs to the cardiovascular system. So these are different organ systems that are located in the same region. So that's why it's called regional anatomy. Surface anatomy is going to study the surface markings of the body to try to understand the relationship of these surface markings with deep or internal anatomy through either visualization, if it's superficial, you can see the markings, or palpation, which means gentle touch. And we're also going to define it later on in this learning outcome. The next one and last is the pathological anatomy. Like the name says, it's going to study structure changes from gross to microscopic anatomy associated with disease, because pathology means disease. Moving on, we're going to define gross anatomy and the different types of anatomical imaging. A couple of type of studies that are used for anatomy are gross and microscopic anatomy. Gross anatomy basically is going to consider large structures, such as, in this case, the brain. And you don't really need an equipment to be able to use gross anatomy to study large structures. However, in case of microscopic anatomy, you can study the same organs, but you will need uh, equipment. In this case, it's a microscope to be able to look at the cells of the brain. In this case, we can see neuron cells right over here. And you can also see glial cells surrounding the neurons. There are several imaging techniques that can be used to try to diagnose diseases. Here I have listed six of them and we will be discussing them in the next few slides. X-rays use invisible electromagnetic energy beams to produce these images of internal tissues or bones or even organs. It can either be on a film, like in the old days, or even digital media, like it's done most recently. Uh, standard x-rays are performed for many reasons, including diagnosing tumors or bone injuries. In this case, there is a slight bone injury right over here on the head of the radius and you can see there's a little crack right over there so this one is used for uh, bone injury an ultrasound is a procedure that uses high energy sound waves to look at tissues and organs inside the body it's specially used for pregnant women to observe the fetus and we can see right over here the image that it produces so these sound waves will make an echo that will form these pictures of the tissues and organs on a computer screen. And you can clearly see the fetal formation on these images. Computed tomography, commonly known as CT scan, is similar to an x-ray because it does use this x-ray image that's made using a form of tomography. Tomography just means that it's a technique for displaying a representation of a cross-section through the human body in which a computer is actually what will control the motion of the x-ray source and detectors and then it will process that data and produce the image that we see right over here on this screen. 
Next we have the digital subtraction in geography. Angel means blood vessels, so this will provide an image of the blood vessels in the brain to be able to detect a problem with a blood flow. Now the procedure involves inserting a catheter, which is a small thin tube, into an artery in the leg and passing up to the blood vessel in the brain. So it does uh, have some risk to the patient, but uh, through this catheter, they will insert a dye. And through this dye, we're able to see the blood vessels inside of the brain, as we can see from this image. And then we can transfer it to a computer and be able to see it in better contrast. Next, we have what we call the magnetic resonance imaging, or better known as MRI, which is basically a procedure that will use these radio waves together with a very powerful magnet. And then uh, this will produce an image that is sent to the computer. And here is an example of what we can see on the computer using MRI. Lastly, we'll be covering the positron emission tomography, which is better known as PET scan, a procedure in which a small amount of radioactive glucose, which is basically sugar, is going to be injected into a vein. And then you're going to use a scanner to make detailed uh, computerized pictures of areas inside of the body where the glucose is going to be taken up. Because cancer cells often take up more glucose than normal cells, the pictures can be used to find cancer cells in the body. There are also simple diagnostic techniques that can be used instead of using those fancy and expensive machines. These techniques are known as inspection, palpation, auscultation, and percussion. I try to remember IPAP. It makes it easier for me to remember all of them. First, let's talk about inspection. Now, in medical terms, inspection means to look at the person or body part. Just like when you take your car to be inspected, it's the same concept. In this image here of inspection, the doctor is using what we call an otoscope, which is basically going to be able to check the ear canal for any infection. Then we have what we call palpation. Palpation means that it's an examination by pressing on the surface of the body to be able to feel the organs or tissue underneath. This doctor over here is examining lymph nodes on the neck and they're using their hand to palpate the neck region to see if the lymph nodes are inflamed. And if they are inflamed, they're usually painful and this means that there might be an infection in the body. Now, don't get palpation confused with palpitation. Palpitation means that it is an accelerated heart rate. So these two might be sometimes a little bit confusing. Next, we have what we call auscultation, which is a method that is used to listen to the sounds of the body during your physical examination, for example, using a stethoscope, which is this device right over here. Now, usually you can hear a patient's heart, the lungs, intestines. These are the most common organs that are used during this method. Last, we have what is called a percussion. In the percussion, you're going to use a tapping method. So you're going to be tapping certain body parts with your fingers or your hands or even small instruments as part of this physical examination. And this uh, method is done, done to determine, for example, the size, the consistency, and the borders of a body organ. So if there is a presence, for example, of fluid or absence of fluid in certain body areas, it can also be used for that.